And welcome back to the Great American Sports Network. Clint Schweitzer and Noah Groninger being joined by WWE Hall of Famer Mick Foley. Mick, how you doing this morning? How's everything going in your world, my man? Hey, I'm doing great. Uh, you guys are my wake-up call, so forgive me if something uh, unintelligible comes <laughs> Comes, comes out of my mouth. I'm not responsible for anything I say in the next five minutes. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what we that's what we do here at the Great American Sports Network, Nick. <laughs> and uh, you know, I don't know if your manager told you, but uh, you know, this is actually going to be a 25 minute analysis on your match with Norman the Lunatic at Clash of the Champions 10. <laughs> so, if that's okay. <laughs> but, and you go back a ways. Huh? That's a that's a long time ago. Oh, absolutely. But uh, you know, when we're starting here, because we're here in Kansas City, and you're getting ready to roll through here. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, the 27th, uh, at the Improv, and I wanted to kind of start there because uh, this world tour, you know, that which just kicked off, I believe, the other day, uh, the cheap pop segment that's aired on the WWE Network, and let's just give kind of fans, uh, you know, a little bit of um, background and what, what they can expect here Wednesday night, because if uh, people haven't seen the cheap pops on WWE Network, what, what, what can they expect from this uh, show here at 7 o'clock at, at the Improv, Nick? Yeah, well, it won't be, uh, the cheap pops is a great, breakthrough for me because it kind of uh, you know answered the question like well, what does he do because people would always come on and say well, oh it's stand up comedy and then I'd have to try to say well it's not really stand up comedy it's like it, it was difficult to explain what it was until people saw it so for anyone who's, who's listening to your show who hasn't seen Cheap Pops you're like uh, you're not really explaining <laughs> you're not really explaining it now either but people who saw it got it and uh, and then now the challenge is to say, look, that was the last show on that tour. And now, uh, you know, I took a month off in Kansas City School. This is the first night of the new tour. So it'll be uh, all new stories. And uh, and uh, the first night, you know, you know <laughs> you're, you're trying a lot of stuff. And, and some of it's going to be good work, some of it won't. And then you try to have fun with the stuff that doesn't work, you know, because uh, sometimes that can be as memorable as the, uh, the stories that kill. Well, Mick, you used to get pumped up for big wrestling matches by listening to Tori Amos's Winter. Do you still do that before big uh, <laughs> comedy gigs here? No, no, I haven't, I haven't found the... the <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't need to go that deep. Uh, <laughs> that deep. It's a different, different type of uh, uh, nerves. You know, I don't. I don't think people need me uh, super pumped when I come out there because it's you know it's conversational. Uh, I mean, I do get into it. I get into you know it's, it is a it is a performance. You know, using cheap pops. You know, there's like it's a performance. It's not just a chat. Um, but no, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't needed to get that deep. Uh, thus far. Well, so, you know, you've talked about this uh, before. You said, um, you know, basically that if it looks easy, if it looks like what's happening on stage is natural, that that's good because it means you've put so much work into it that it's coming off that way. I mean, what kind of methods, what do you do as far as honing this craft? I mean, do you, have, do you sift back through, you know, old stories? Because, I mean, in Cheap Pops, you talk about, you know, old stories, old wrestling stories from the road, just kind of random things that would pop up. I mean, how do you kind of find these stories and then relate them in, in a, you know, in a comedic element? Uh, how, do, how does that kind of come about for you? Well, you, you know, a lot of it's just trial and error. You see what's working and what's not. And then every night you go out there and try to find a different way uh, to, you know, to make the stories better, and and uh, <laughs> I probably shouldn't be saying this again, but the Kansas City's the first show, and there's something really cool about that for me because it won't be the stories that I've I've really <laughs> it will be the antithesis of what I said uh, during the Team Pop show because uh, I will be struggling a little bit, and then uh, but it's 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 fun that way. And then I'll, I'll make sure I make up for it. If a couple of stories don't connect, I'll make I'll make up for it by being extra nice at the post show meet and greet. I absolutely can't wait for that, Mick. We'll definitely be there. And of course, no one I were on hand talking about Kansas City. We were on hand in uh, May of '99 uh, for Over the Edge uh, when Owen Hart tragically passed away. Does it does it get eerie when you? I know I don't know how often you get back here. I know you've been back for for events before. Does it, does it get kind of eerie when you come back through here at all? I mean, does it just kind of bring back, I mean, any of those memories? Well, I think it's the arena specifically. It's not the, the not the city that brings back anything bad. 
I remember, I have not been in that arena in a, in a long time. This will be the re arena, not the city. And uh, I had a chance to write something nice uh, for Owens, who what would have been his 50th birthday, and then I wrote something a couple of days ago for his, uh, you know, 16 years since his passing. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of pay tribute to him. But I don't. Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't. I don't connect the city, city of Kansas City with his uh, with his death as much as I do the arena. Okay, uh, we have a Facebook fan question here from Jeffrey Miller, uh, who asks: After all the things you've accomplished in your life, heavyweight champion, infinite crowd pleaser, best-selling author, husband, father, what's one thing you'd still like to accomplish? I uh, some inappropriate just flashed through my head. Uh, <laughs> Please that's why I shouldn't be having you get, uh, Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't want people to take things the wrong way. Uh, sometimes I still like to accomplish. Uh, I have not conquered the world of uh, pornography uh, the way I'd, I'd <laughs> like to. Yeah. I think people want to see this body unclothed and in action. You are the hardcore icon, Mick. What, yeah, what, it's got to work. I told uh, my my son, Huey, was uh, he's uh, a creative guy, and he's looking to do uh, like a YouTube channel, and he wanted to say something about hardcore, and I had to break it to him that <laughs> hardcore can mean a couple different things. You know, like <laughs> you don't necessarily want people. <laughs> you know, you know. I don't want him taking that stroll, that you know, stroll on on Google for hardcore. You know, so uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, just stay away from that word. Uh, Mix. So I'm gonna go back a little bit to your wrestling career, and one, you know, there's just so many things, and you talked about so many things. People are very, you know, aware of of the Monday Night Wars, your uh, role as Mankind, Dude Love, and Cactus Jack, and those times. I want to quickly. Deviate back to WCW 91 because that's kind of where I became familiar with you and uh, your feud with Sting when you came out uh, of the gift box and attacked Sting. And then leading into uh, uh, Halloween Havoc 91, which is the Chamber of Horrors. As a kid, I bought it. And this has Dusty Rhodes written all over it as an adult. Like, let's go back to Chamber of Horrors. I've never uh, heard you really comment on that event and uh, kind of the eight-man uh, brawl and you, uh, you know, lighting the lethal, lethal lever on your buddy there. Uh, um, Abdullah the Butcher in the chair. Like, let's go back to that. What was your memories of Chamber of Horrors? Well, there's a reason there was never a Chamber of Horrors too. <laughs> I wanted one. I wanted to see one. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it didn't seem that You know, at the time, uh, I'm, I'm sure if you, I haven't looked at it since. You know, there was so much going on. There was so much mayhem. Uh, I, I don't think all of it was bad, but, uh, it, you know, I've said it before about, you know, wrestling is about creating, like, memories, you know, moments. And, uh, you know, people tend to forget the matches and remember the moments. And unfortunately for the Chamber of Horrors, <laughs> the moments people <laughs> remember were awful. You know, there was the, uh, you know, first of all, the, the idea to get somebody into an electric chair, you know, to, <laughs> to, to the, the, the finale is we are going, yeah, we're going to kill someone. We're going to electrocute somebody. And uh, uh, to do that, you had to turn a switch, pull it from the off position to the on position. And everyone could see that the switch had fallen into <laughs> the position <laughs> on its own just a few minutes into the match. So I had to climb up the uh, the chamber, pretend that I hadn't seen it, like move it back to the off position, <laughs> then the, and then pretend I didn't see like uh, Rick Steiner reversing the suplex as uh, Abdullah the Butcher was in the chair. And then I basically electrocuted my best friend who was carried out uh, lifeless by uh, a group of druids. Dru <laughs> and then uh, shockingly came came back to life. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was awful, but it was fun while it was happening. I, yeah, I still remember it. I just remember Tony Schiavone's call while the electrocution was being taken place, and he goes, he's being cucked! I mean, <laughs> that is just the greatest thing that's ever happened, uh, maybe in wrestling, so... Well, uh, moving on, obviously uh, winning the WWE title uh, from The Rock January 4th, 1999. Uh, that was a huge crowning achievement in your career. But uh, over at WCW, 
uh, they were giving away the results to that show and kind of poked fun at you winning the title. So oh, that'll put butts in the seats. Uh, so I wanted to get your first reaction uh, as to when you heard that they had done that. And did that take away from your moment at all winning the title? Well, it did. Uh, it, you know, it, it did. At, at the time, it felt like it did. And then uh, what I did not know and what uh, WCW you know, had no way of knowing is that when they gave away, uh, they gave away the result with the uh, uh, hopes of, uh, of uh, uh, weakening the WWE audience. And instead, it was like within like 30 seconds, I think 500,000 uh, people, like 300,000 homes, 500,000 people, whatever the word, whatever it worked out to be, like they simultaneously switched over to WWE. So what should have been a huge success for uh, WCW, who was live in the Georgia Dome in front of almost 50,000 people, uh, it turned out to be a huge, like the biggest success, not only for WWE as a company, but for me uh, personally. And I don't think that we ever lost in the ratings again. Like it was really, uh, yeah, it was kind of a, you know, uh, you know, a watershed moment in the Monday Night Wars. That had a great moment for me because it changed the way that people looked at me. So honestly, the truth is, without Shivani giving away the uh, ending, uh, no, uh, the whole con- my whole perception within wrestling is different, and you and I are probably not on the phone having this conversation I'm probably not coming to Kansas City to talk about my career. Oh, we'd still want you on the phone, Mick. We'd still want you. But uh, looking... Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Tony. Thank you, Uncle <laughs> thank Tony. You. Uh, looking back at your wrestling career, what do you think is the biggest risk that you've taken that's really paid off, and what accomplishment are you most proud of? Ah, uh, biggest risk? I don't know if it paid off, but, I mean, the, the, the night uh, with the cell, uh, the, with me and the Foley family referred to the heck in a cell, uh, those are a couple. Those are a couple of big risks, and uh, one of them paid off. One of them didn't. Uh, but in the end, you know, we created, a, like I referred to, in the moments. You know, that you try to cast these indelible moments. And uh, that night, we did a, you know, you know, created some images that people still remember. You know, 17, 17 years later, and we created uh, greatest accomplishment. Uh, man, that's yet to come. That's uh, tomorrow night on stage at the Improv. Uh, not a cheap pop. People... That was not a cheap pop, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> right here. <laughs> right there in Kansas City. Uh, yeah, the best is yet to come. But uh, uh, I don't know. I really do. I love doing these shows. You know, like uh, having a cheap pop special uh, um, and have my family there and have people finally get what I did, you know, and they're like simultaneously, oh my God, he tells stories, you know, like wrestling stories, where they don't have, you know, you, it's, I'm at a comedy venue, but I don't feel any pressure to, uh, you know, adhere to a last per minute uh, ratio, because I'm pretty confident that everyone leaves with a smile on their face. Oh, absolutely, and just uh, can't wait for this, can't wait to, to, to meet you tomorrow night, Mick, we're all excited, and I'll tell you what, uh, you know, and before we let you go, and I want to go back to some of the comedy that you were able to portray in your wrestling career because, you know, obviously as Cactus Jack and as early Mankind, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, comedy in those characters. They were diabolical. And uh, But, you know, when you talk about ECW, and I think the first time that uh, I took note of how hilarious uh, that you were as a person, because I didn't know, I just knew Cactus Jack as this crazy guy from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, which is a great town, by the way. And, uh, of course, yeah. you're not really from there, from New York. But um, just the fact that you wore that Dungeon of Doom shirt that was, like, spray painted like that. That was the first time I ever noticed, like, that there was a comedic element to you. And then, of course, you have to explore that later as mankind. Is that something that, because you are such a funny and personable guy, like, in, in, in real life, is that something that you kind of wanted to start uh, bringing into your wrestling characters? And, and, as, as, and then, of course, it melded into this career now is being able to do comedy uh, for a living. Yeah, um, you know, there are always little elements of it. Here we go back to the, you know, the 91 interviews with Abdul the Butcher, you know, where I would, uh, you know, sometimes sing my promos. Uh, like, and then I would do what Paul Heyman called, laugh, you know, make them laugh and cut them off. You know, like 
make people feel bad about having laughed. Kind of like the uh, looking at the drill sergeant in uh, Full Metal Jacket. Like, yeah, it will make you feel bad about laughing because the next moment, you know, he's he is diabolical. But for me, like the shifting of the gears came uh, after that cell match in '98 because uh, you know I was in a world of hurt after that and realized I'd, I'd have to find a different way to connect with the audience. <sighs> making them wince every night and so um, I started bringing humor into the character and uh, Mankind changed uh, pretty dramatically as a character and lightened up considerably and we ushered in the uh, the rock and stock era uh, you know shortly after that which was known largely for its humor so yeah it was it was always there but it was, I definitely uh, moved it to the forefront uh, after that cell match well, Mick, uh, cannot thank you enough for joining us this morning. Can't thank you enough for letting us wake you up and uh, get the morning started right. And we're so excited to have you here in Kansas City at the Improv. It's at 7 o'clock. Uh, guys, that's up at Zona Rosa, which is a beautiful area in North Kansas City, Mick. Uh, and it's just going to be a wonderful host of this event. There's been many a great comment come through of the Improv, and it's just wonderful to have you up there. Can't thank you enough. We've only scratched the surface, guys. It's going to be so many more stories, so many more great memories. Mick, thank you so much. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. We look forward to seeing you in Kansas City tomorrow night, my man. Sounds good. I'll see you there. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure, All right. Mick. Thanks. Bye.